Hey, welcome everyone to the July meeting of the ESIP Biological Data Standards Cluster. We have been hosting sessions um, ever since the ESIP winter meeting. We've been hosting sessions for different parts of the Biological Data Standards Primer, um, fo focusing in on uh, different sections. Today, we're going to be talking about the habitat classification standards. And so we have Kate Rose, Alexa McCaro, and Rusty Griffin who are here to um, give us quick overviews on those, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion after that. And so let's go ahead and um, kick this off. So uh, it's my ple pleasure to introduce Kate Rose, who is a senior research associate with the Northern Gulf Institute at Mississippi State University, a cooperative institute for NOAA National Centers for Environmental Information. She works on a variety of marine resource mapping projects to support habitat assessment and restoration efforts in the Gulf of Mexico, and is a member of the Coastal and Marine Ecological Classification Standard, CMEX, which is the first one we'll be talking about, implementation group. Uh, Kate holds a master's in earth and environmental studies with a concentration in coastal geology from the University of New Orleans. So Kate, I will stop sharing and turn it over to you to talk about CMEX. Okay, great. Um, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Okay. Wonderful. All right, so um, I guess I'll just start going through the, the, the questions that you had kind of um, sent us to prepare for this. So um, the best and most common use case for this standard for biological data. Um, I guess both CMEX is really concerned with identifying sort of like a, a whole um, ecosystem classification. And so uh, biological data is one of the components of that. Um, but, you know, having said that, uh, any of the CMEX com components can be used to map um, data uh, independently or, or altogether. So you could use like the biotic component um, as a standalone um, sort of like mapping and classification and descriptive tool for your data. Um, and so CMEX, if y'all are familiar with it, is just um, an organization or it's a set of defined terms. Um, and uh, they're hierarchically organized so that, you know, you could, it could be applied to um, data at various levels of whether it's a geospatial scale or um, a level of specificity. And I think in terms of um, biological data, it would be like in terms of specificity. And it's really used to sort of like place organisms or biotic communities rather within an ecological kind of context. And so the biological component of CMEX ranges in the hierarchy from say like um, from the uh, biological setting, which could be like the faunal bed and then it kind of, um, uh, tears down into um, sort of other like subgroupings and subgroups and then finally to a biotic community um, which doesn't get down to species really although there are representative species within those groupings and stuff so that's really like that the main purpose of CMEX is to even within the biotic biotic component is to place the various um, communities within an ecological context like a faunal bed or like a deep cold coral water, cold water reef or something of that nature, you know, and just kind of group them more by ecological function, I suppose, than a traditional um, uh, taxonomic um, nomenclature hierarchy. Um, and so I guess the next question, what does it uniquely offer for biological data that other standards don't? Uh, probably just, maybe just what I just said, you know, it's rather than it being, you know, just a, a taxonomic definition um, or, you know, a mapping tool or something like that. It does just provide that means to um, identify the, the ecological context for a biotic community where subsequently, you know, your individual species or individuals within that community. Um, but then to also, if you did have data to apply to, um, for the other components, say if like you had water column component data, so that if you were looking at different like currents or different oxygen levels or temperature and salinity measurements um, surrounding, you know, whether those organisms are situated, whether those communities are situated, or if you had like the substrate type or, you know, sandy bottom or perhaps like a, you know, um, 
other features of the ecosystem um, are easily tied together um, using the CNEX components and things like that. So um, I think that that's pretty unique and you know, being that CMEX is just like a bit more stand expansive, I suppose, than something that's a strictly biological uh, data standard. Um, and then as far as the limitations, hmm, that is very hard for me to answer because I guess I'm not, um, I haven't used the uh, biotic component so much. Um, I'm more of a geoform substrate person, but um, I think that, you know, our limitations, well, <laughs> you know, we try to provide a lot of flexibility for it, you know, because CMEX isn't supposed to be a pres prescriptive system. There's no, you know, workflow tied to it. You're not, you're, you're not required to map to a certain standard. But I think that sort of flexibility also, unfortunately, allows for like a little ambiguity. And I think that people have a lot of time, sometimes have a hard time kind of understanding exactly how to, how to implement it. Um, in that way. So, um, and as I said, you know, it, we really only classify down to a community level rather than, you know, a specific species. And so I think that some people find that, you know, that once they're done with a CMEX classification, they still need to go ahead and apply something else to in order to get that information. So. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. That was excellent. Um, I, I think we have a little bit of time for questions uh, in between, just maybe a one or two um, before we go into the discussion at the end too, so, which is another place for questions. So um, if anyone has any questions, I do see Stace asked if there's a good link. Um, she found a PDF dated 2012. So maybe, I don't know, that maybe that's one, Kate, that you can answer in the chat. But if anyone else had any questions that they wanted to ask Kate, Okay, Kate, I might ask you a quick question. Um, so this standard, does it go all the way into the rocky inner tidal? So is it basically where land meets sea and all the way out? Is that where, um, if you were going to use it, the data that would make sense? Yes, so that's a good question. And I didn't mention that, but um, so the whole, the entirety, the domain or, or the range of CMEX as far as like where the, the environments that it covers, is um, on the landward side, it covers either to like the heads of tide in say an estuary or, or inlet or something like that, but also to like the splash zone, the extent of the, the splash zone. So it does cover something like a rocky intertidal area. We have a lot of um, features and, um, and descriptors for, uh, for those environments. And so it goes all the way from the, that, that area of the coast kind of cutting off at the, the head of tides, as I said, and then all the way to like the depths of the oceans or Great Lakes. And so um, when CMEX was being developed, the team coordinated with uh, folks like, not specifically Rusty, but um, at the Fish and Wildlife Service about the National Wetlands Inventory. And so there is a, there is a little bit of overlap, um, mostly in our vegetative classes um, between sort of like wetlands classification where we try to align so we have like, you know, similar um, sort of uh, definitions and things like that, um, not just with the NWI, but also with the National Vegetation Classification, you know, who kind of have come into play when we were talking about like um, sort of hardwood, like upland hardwoods and things like that. Um, so we're supposed to sort of like seamlessly interface with those so that there is a potential to have like, you know, not a single classification, you know, for terrestrial, like all the way to the bottom of the ocean, but at least to have some some similarities to ease the translation or, you know, something like that between the two class, between those environments. Great. Awesome. Um, okay, Stace, one quick question. Hi, Kate, my quick question. I was just browsing the terms in the PDF and I did note, I'm, I'm liking these biotic groups in a sense because they offer a way to, a way to talk about a group of a community of of organisms that I it's unusual like I, you don't see that in mm. many other standards so like I can't think of a way that I would declare that in Darwin core but I could certainly think of a way yeah. I could use this with in in terms of using it as keywords for data sets for example like I could say I chose a keyword from CMIX and then say that I you know grabbed it from CMIX 
Yeah, I think that that's a really good point. You know, I mean, so on, on the one hand, CMEX is, you know, it's a set of terms, defined terms. So it's like a, a controlled vocabulary. And I think that my just um, joining in and like <laughs> with ESIP over the past year and working with people in semantic harmonization has like in, lastly, like made me more aware of, of these different, the differences in, in between these things. But so on the one hand, it is a controlled vocabulary. So it's terms and definitions. Those are kind of keywords, right? But then the thing with CMEX as well is that there are also, you know, relationships between the terms from and the definitions and the units from the different components that, you know, where some are related to the others, which, you know, which you don't have to utilize and you don't have to apply those, but it does sort of help you if you do want to do that. It's sort of instructive if you know like, okay, well here is a shoal and then it has a represent, it has a relationship with, you know, these sediment classes here. So you may want to apply both of these for a shoal if that is important habitat for you and things like that. So, so that's a good point, but I think that keywords, yes. And I don't know, you know, I think that very early on after they had first published it at NCEI, we did sort of like a pilot because we had our very own like sort of um, customized uh, metadata uh, editing tool called Mermaid. And so we kind of built a little thesaurus so you could just go and choose a pick list from the thesaurus and, you know, as your keywords and things like that. So, I mean, there are multiple uses for it, but definitely keywords are one thing, so. Great. Right. Thank I you. see there's a question from Pierre in the chat, but I'm going to hold that one. Pierre, I think that would be a good question for all the panelists. So I'm going to hold that one until the discussion. Um, and we'll move on next to um, Alexa. So I'm excited to introduce Alexa Macaro, who is a scientist emerita with the USGS Bio Biogeographic Science Branch. At USGS, she has been involved in vegetation mapping and species distribution modeling. Today, Alexa will talk to us about the National Vegetation Classification Standard. Alexa? Yeah, hey, hey, Abby, thanks. Um, so the National Vegetation Classification Standard is related to describing plant communities. So it's really focused on um, dominant and diagnostic species and how they characterize a, a plant community. And it was developed by the Federal Geographic Data Committee, the vegetation subcommittee of that group. And it is, the peer review is managed by the ESA Veg Panel, the Ecological Society of America Veg Panel is the scientific oversight for that standard. Um, it's considered a dynamic content standard. So the FGDC uh, Veg Subcommittee put together the document that says, how do you describe types in the classification and the uh, individuals or uh, the ecologists are writing the, the dynamic content and then that, that gets peer reviewed. Um, so it's an eight level classification, eight level hierarchy. Um, it goes down from the most coarse level is like the class level, which would be uh, forest types or things like that. It goes down to association, which is where um, you know something about the dominant species in the overstory and the understory. And there is some overlap with CMEX uh, at the association and alliance level, I think. Um, they worked with that subcommittee on that. Um, so good examples of its uses are the National Park Service has used, has developed a lot of the content actually for the NBC. Um, in their mapping project. So they have mapped each of the 270 units of the National Parks Service in the country. And as part of that, they went out and did sampling of vegetation communities, and then they developed classification specific to that park. And then they mapped those types and then went out and did accuracy assessments. Uh, another example is uh, the Land Fire Program has recently done a national map um, and they, They've actually done created two maps with two different legends, and the, they did the first uh, nationwide map of the NBC group levels, group level, uh, which is a mid-level of the classification hierarchy. Um, other good examples are the state heritage programs. Uh, they go out and they're monitoring vegetation communities in their state, um, and so they've contributed quite a bit to the classification through their work on the ground. Um, and then our group 
the gap analysis program has used plant communities as one of our ways of characterizing habitat distribution. Um, and so in the past, we've used ecological systems. Uh, we're trying to work towards getting to using the group level of the national veg classification as the plant community types that we attribute a species as present or uh, absent from. And we're starting to work with the forest inventory and analysis program to link. Uh, they've done a lot of work to link their plots to the NBC, and then we're working with them to link uh, our habitat classification, our habitat distribution models to those plots directly, which would be really important um, because you could actually get spatial uh, estimates of types uh, for or habitat for species if we can successfully do that. Um, <clears throat> and then what makes it unique is that uh, it addresses all vegetation types. So it goes from wall to wall. If it's more than 10% uh, vegetation, then it should have a type described in the classification. Um, another advantage to it is that it is hierarchical um, so that the classification scales with the question or the data. Um, so if you're, if you have, you know, moderate level of information with respect to what the vegetation is on a site, you can assign it to a moderate level in the hierarchy. Um, if you know all of the dominant diagnostic species, you can get it down to an association level. Um, the other standards tend to focus on a single theme. So you have forest classification from the Forest Service or rangeland classification that NRCS uses. Um, so the NBC is trying to bridge those classifications so that if you have a type on the ground, you can describe it. Um, so the advantage there is just walking across jurisdictions and having a common language. And then the limitation uh, is, I mean, we've been working on the NBC. The initial standard was published in 1997. There's been a tremendous amount of work done uh, by the ecologists to get the current content developed. Uh, but there's still uneven levels of net data and knowledge across some of the types. So um, one of the places where we don't have a lot of information is in rural vegetation types. People generally haven't sampled rural vegetation very much, or um, so there's that. Um, another limitation would be it requires data related to the dominance and diagnostics of the species at all levels of the strata, or at all strata. So um, there might be inventory programs out there that are collecting data that don't get enough information about the dominant diagnostic species to actually classify it to a type. Um, and then sampling, uh, in order to sample for the NBC or describing types or labeling types, you really need to focus on a coherent community. So when it's not just a random point that's laid out on the ground, so there are sampling schemes out there where you just go to a random point and you uh, collect vegetation data. If that happens to be a mixed condition, then you can't really assign it to a type because uh, you know these are trying to describe coherent vegetation types. So that's that's all I had. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Alexa. That was really informative. Um, are there any questions for Alexa about the MBC? Okay, I this question that Pierre had, I think. Oh, Pierre, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the overview. Um, is that hosted online in a so each term has a IRI, or is it still is there is there a web page or so? There, there is a website, and I'll I'll put that in the chat. Um, and there's also uh, so there's multiple websites, but the USNBC.org is the website where you can look and explore the classification and get some background. Um, but then Great, I'll thanks. Put and, 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 and does each does each term have like a an identified term uh, uh, link that is so that there's a link dedicated to each term yeah there there is for each vegetation type there's a description some of them have more some of them have a lot of no data or no information for this description but um, yeah they all have a um, they all have a link with a description that you can download and read. Thanks. This is where it's getting exciting as things like CMEX and, and NBS and things come online in this sort of linked open data world. 
um, so much more as possible to connect it up to other semantic uh, infrastructures. So really nice to see. Okay, great. Great. Thanks so much, Alexa. Thanks, Pierre, for the question. Um, so last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce Rusty Griffin, who is a physical scientist with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. He oversees national consistency and quality control for the wetlands layer of the national spatial data infrastructure. And we'll talk to us today about the National Wetland Classification Standard. Rusty? Hi, yeah, everyone. Um, so the national, it's called the National Wetlands and Deep Water Classification System. Um, it's most commonly referred to as Coordin. Um, it uh, covers from intermittent streams and drier end wetlands all the way to the depths of the ocean, um, covering wetlands and deep water habitats. Um, most commonly it's used in the National Wetland Inventory in the mapping of wetlands for the, the nation. Uh, it's medium resolution is its most common sort of uh, application. It's used in conjunction with the wetland mapping standard, which you know sets forth protocols for mapping of wetlands as well. Um, some of the things that make it unique is there is a minimum standard for classification. So it's you know for the past 40 years, you've had consistent depth of classification. It requires you to map. Um, system, subsystem class, subclass, and water regime for everything that goes into the National Wetlands Inventory. Um, it's national, it's been around since 1979, so it's uh, pretty widely used and understood. There's a shorthand key um, for descriptions to be turned into code used for mapping, so you can sort of speak in shorthand to people, and most people understand, especially wetland ecologists will understand what you mean when you say PEM1A, will understand what you're talking about. Um, it was adopted as an FGDC, um, FGDC standard in 2013, and as such went into version two, and there were a few modifications there. But for the most part, you know, the guts of coordinate have not changed, and you can you can talk to the old people and the new people about coordinate, and they will know pretty much what you're talking about. Um, another thing that's unique about it is how flexible it is. There's a possibility for millions of like 10.7 million code combinations in Coordin, but the majority of the maps we have, I think in the data set, which contains 35 million polygons, there's only 8,000 codes used. So sort of the medium resolution for Coordin that will use about 8,000 codes, but it can be used for field surveys because of the possibility of drilling down using the hierarchical system and coming up with combinations that are, you know, beyond the scope of the NWI mapping. It's used by um, uh, smaller scale data sets like NLCD, CCAP. They'll pare down the hierarchical pieces into smaller smaller codes that encompass broader ecological ranges. So the order itself, the, the classification itself is used from 30 meter pixels all the way down to field surveys. Um, limitations of the classification system I mean, this is kind of an interesting question because there are lots of limitations with the data themselves, the NWI data, because of its medium resolution, it's based on photo interpretation. There's not a lot of money to go in the field sometimes. So there's lots of limitations with the data, but the limitations of the classification system are, well, talking to the, the authors of the coordinate, they, they are very, they always felt like they didn't do very well in the um, freshwater tidal range and Alaska. Um, the people who wrote Coordin were based in the Midwest and the Northeast. So there's a lot of, there's really good descriptions for potholes and uh, Northeast wetlands like bogs and stuff, but there's not a lot of good descriptions for Alaska type wetlands. Um, and it, as we start to map Alaska now, I think I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of those limitations in the classification of, you know, what do we call this? Because there isn't really a good, you know, not a good bucket to put these wetlands in. Um, also, there's a lot of limitations with the, um, the protocols in which we, we map and classify wetlands. Um, lots of stuff underwater we can't see. So anything that has to do with substrate, that's a limitation for how we're classifying wetlands in the mapping portion. Um, there's overlap with CMEX that we, we hope helps fill in those gaps uh, with the freshwater tidal and the, um, anything that's underwater. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got. Excellent. Thanks so much, Rusty. Um, I learned a lot. I didn't know too much about the wetlands classification, so uh, so thanks. Uh, any questions for Rusty? 
before we move into discussion. Uh, so, uh, same question for me about uh, just the, the web presence. Like, is it, is it online? Do the, the codes have sort of IRIs attached to? So the, the data themselves are online, yes. Um, there are ways on the data set to decode the mapping codes into wetland descriptions. Um, I'll, I can, I'll post the, like the PDF of the classification itself in the chat. Um, we have internal here. So because the code system is so large, uh, it, it's contained within a SQL data set. Um, and we can create sort of custom lists and stuff, but I, there's nothing, it's too large to put online. I don't know exactly what you mean, but the codes, that, like the coding themselves and the descriptions are online, yes. Um, interacting with the codes and interacting with the description is kind of a one-step process that you should contact me for. <laughs> Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think Pierre, did that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting close, you know, but um, even if it's large, well, I know the, the combinatorial space is massive, of course, but, you know, like the basic ingredients, um, it's just really useful to have some kind of uh, web link to them as we're trying to, like, interweave all of these different kinds of classification standards and make them work with systems like OVIS and some of the um, regional infrastructures we're trying to sort of map, especially on a, you know, US, EU, Australia scale. There's a lot of this stuff that um, it, it's really it's really a lot of work that's gone into creating these national or regional standards. And um, the more we can get them on the web somehow, it's, it's we can start this interoperability push. That's interesting. I, I guess what what would you want it to look like? I because I, I think that that's something I can create. We can create. I would like I would like to know what you would want it to look like and how you like. What do you want it to be? That would be my question. Maybe we can do it offline, yeah. but I would like to talk more about this. Sure, sure. It, it's like the basic thing for like setting up semantic resources, like the SORI ontologies vocabularies, right? Just like a web presence. But yeah, we can talk about it. Um, uh, I think you know. Kate, Kate's aware of it. We, she's seen us uh, cook up a bunch of these things too. And uh, yeah, happy to happy to pick up on that. I would love to join you guys if you're gonna have an offline discussion about that because I still have so much to learn <laughs> about it, but yeah. Yeah, cool. I mean, it's, you know, this whole fair data thing, right? So the first sub principle of fair is having these sort of dereferenceable permanent identifiers, right? Out there on the web for these things, these objects, these entities. So yeah, uh, let's, let's follow up. Maybe in one of the semantic calls, we can uh, allocate some time to that. I'd be happy to be part of that as well. I, I think that if there's something we can do to put the classification out there in a more you know palatable way, I, I'm all for it. Yeah, that'd be great. And this ESIP is a great place to get that kind of feedback on it and, and how to do that because um, that's really a place that ESIP focuses in on is, are those kinds of uh, ways of sharing the information. Um, and making it linkable. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, um, as far as what something like that might look at like, um, I've always found it really helpful to have some kind of programming in interface to these things. Like, you know, I'm a data person and all these biologists give me a list of species and to connect those species names up to the code that you need, like in Worms, Worms has this nice programming interface that you can just batch submit, you know, a bunch of species and get back the codes, things like that. So I think so those sorts of things are really helpful. Is that something that you're using for like analysis or so like, for example, you're just getting species and you're supposed to analyze data to find out like where the habitats are or what um, yeah, various things. Um, for me, mostly it's to do things like put um, data into OBUS and so that you have, you know, a certain species code that means this species. Um, a lot of times, you know, all these scientists, they make up their own codes or whatever. But if you have this standard code that, you know, identifies the species, then you're set to do comparisons and things. So we have a on the online, you can download a tool that will turn all the mapping codes and give you like all the descriptions um, that exists. 
Um, it's just a, I think it's um, HTML. Yeah, what do we call that? HTML pop-up uh, widget uh, as part of ArcGIS. Um, and we have those tools online. I can just, I'll find those and I'll put them in the chat as well. Um, if you need something more like, uh, you know, to batch things, I could provide the guts of that tool as, you know, like more like a lookup table. Um, if you're like linking them or whatever, I could, we can do that. I have the ability to do that like in seconds. If that's what you want. But I, that, like I said, that information, it doesn't just sit on the web. For anybody to look at, it's just it's too cumbersome. I think so many people from the public interact with our data that so sometimes giving people all the information just causes us more headaches. So we gotta keep there's some things we keep like for scientists kind of behind lock and key, and I guess I'm the gatekeeper. Um, so if there's stuff you need, like I'm happy to give it to you, but as of right now, those things don't sit sort of publicly facing. Gotcha. Yeah, and Pierre put a link in the chat. I don't know if you saw it, Rusty, for what he was kind of um, talking about. So, um, yeah, did Lynn, did you have more? To... No, you're good. Okay, uh, Pierre. Just, just a word of encouragement to, to Rusty and others. You know, you know, we're moving into a more data, data driven sort of world. And a lot of people, data scientists are interested in this stuff. So I, I wouldn't be reluctant anymore to sort of expose the, the guts of things. Um, it is true we're gonna need interfaces for people who are not data scientists, et cetera. But, uh, you know, it's, I think the time has come, you know, we can all, we all enjoy each other's uh, systems and, you know, we can, we can hack our way through them. Great, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, so I did, Pierre, your question I think is a good one for all of the panelists, which uh, was asking about the update and review process. Is it formalized for each of the standards? Um, so Kate, why don't, we, why don't we go in order that you all presented? So Kate, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. So um, we at CMEX, we're also an FGDC uh, dynamic content standard, right? So, um, and you know, they have a recommended review cycle of five years and CMEX was first published in 2012. So we're, we've been going through it kind of slowly <laughs> over the past couple of years, trying to, um, we do have a process uh, that, um, that we follow and uh, you can see the details of it um, I, on the webpage I posted a link to um, earlier in the chat. So the details are sort of up there. So what we're basically doing is, or we, what we have done, um, you know, is had a sort of like a web form out available for people to, you know, submit comments or submit what we call change proposals. We never really got a whole lot of input from that, <laughs> you know, but because, uh, you know, I'm a member of the CMEX implementation group and that's, you know, a bunch of people who are the original developers and so forth. And so, we're contacted all the time for people asking for guidance about it, or, you know, I, there are a lot of people on the IG who work for uh, the NOAA Office for Coastal Management, and, you know, they kind of partner with various, and so he, you know, that Mark Finkbeiner there is always consulting with other projects that are going on and giving recommendations on how to apply it. So we sort of have like a good idea of some certain things that we know need that are not clear in CMAX, things that people wanna change. So over the past couple of years, we just started ho holding these sort of like informal kind of like listening sessions to kind of go through what the problem is in detail. You know, we're doing it all, you know, just video calls, right? Because of um, COVID and so forth. But um, so we go through that and then we kind of like work through as a group with the people who are perhaps even proposing it, or we just kind of like get together some people who we know use CMX a lot, subject matter experts, and kind of go through the, the process and kind of come up with an idea of, you know, how to resolve it, whether it's resolvable in CMEX, whether it's, you know, fitting for us or, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and then once we sort of come to sort of a conclusion within that group, then we kind of go to the, the implementation group as a whole and, you know, get them to kind of vote yes or no on it. And so we've kind of gone through that process all the way, I think once. <laughs> um, and then we have a lot of other stuff sort of in the works. Um, we're going through some working groups for uh, the geoform and substrate component right now. And part of the holdup of like not being able to go ahead and announce or fully implement and publish these changes is that at the moment we don't have 
like an organized an established system for managing changes to the vocabulary but like working with ESIP is kind of showing me the way to go forward and I'm kind of learning how to do it myself. <laughs> and um, so Pierre and the others in the semantic conversation uh, work group have been really helpful with that. So I'm really looking forward to doing that as we get more changes that come along. But yeah, but same as is we're supposed to be able to like accept and, you know, adjudicate um, any like change proposal at any time, you know, even though we have a five-year review standard, people should be able to like make their, um, you know, contact us and say something's wrong and then we should be able to like look at it and, and figure it out so yeah great yeah I, it's hard because you know you have to have people on the other end of that ready to take in those you know suggestions and figure out what to do with them and so yeah it takes time um mm -hmm. alexa um, i think you talked a bit about it sorry but maybe just yes. a little bit more okay. sure um we there are <clears throat> there's a lot of activity ongoing. Uh, the ESA Veg Panel um, has a position, the editor in chief role of that panel that actually manages the review, and he's in the process right now of uh, working with different regional groups to actually get reviews of of the group level of the NBC, and now they're trying to go group to alliance and make sure that the linkages up and down the hierarchy are working uh, and make sense. Um, so it is very formalized with the panel and there's a regional, um, there's a, a group of regional editors and associate editors that are to review types that are proposed for, for edits. Um, Right now, most of the editing is being done through this editor-in-chief working with these regional work groups to get things uh, proposed for revisions. But in the future, anyone could submit a, a proposed change and it would go through a peer review process. Uh, it's not a strict, uh, there is a step in the peer review where you talk to other people who have some interest in that type so that you don't just have this constant you know, one person says it's this way and then that gets reviewed and then it doesn't fit in with the other types that are around it, you know, so you're trying to make sure that all the types are described and you're, um, you're setting the boundaries between them uh, in a way that other people in the field would agree. Um, so there's a plan right now for a 2023 edition. Uh, and then after that, uh, probably the, we're looking at like a five year go back and look at the hierarchy again. Uh, there, in 1997, there was an initial hierarchy that wasn't very functional for the agencies. And so in 2008, there was a new hierarchy that was actually proposed and accepted. Um, the hierarchy revisions working group was established and they created the new hierarchy, which is more, um, more focused on dominant diagnostic species as opposed to just structure, which the original uh, original classification or hierarchy was based on. So I think I got, I think I answered all the questions. Thanks, Alexa. Um, Rusty? Yeah, so the update and review process for NWI data themselves is formalized. Uh, we update between 50 million and 150 million acres a year. Uh, those updates are on May 1st and October 1st, twice a biannual. Um, usually it's split about 25, 25, about half and half will put up each part of the year. The review process is stipulated in another uh, data standard, the wetland mapping standard. Um, we, the Fish and Wildlife Service review each project before it comes in. A big part of my job is the review of the data before it gets published to, to the internet. Um, the classification itself, the review process and update is formalized through FGDC. There's a committee that has to be formed before we make any changes to the classification system itself. Like I mentioned before, it was just formalized by FGEC in 2013, and it's under a review now to determine whether or not it needs to be changed and updated for 2023. Um, we're trying to, I mean, the idea of, of having a standard is, uh, you know, consistency and not changing things. So we're trying to, the, the, the approach we take is do no harm. Um, so ideally, like it would, we sort of continue to make small tweaks to make it more, you know, uh, 
applicable to some areas or if there's something that's missing, glaring, missing or omissions, we'll fix those. But in general, the process, the classification has stayed pretty, uh, pretty stagnant uh, for 40 years. I think that's one of the, actually one of the positives about the standard itself. So, but the data themselves are constantly being updated to the tune of, you know, 50 million acres a year. Um, the review process is stipulated and formalized and handled by staff here at NWI. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, you know, I have a question for you, Rusty, which is, you know, you were mentioning that Alaska, um, you know, could could use some updates. So what, how would you envision that process working for that part of the country? So, um, I mean, as they, as scientists go out and they are making maps and they find stuff that doesn't sort of fit in a nice box, like those, those comments get sort of matriculated up to me. Um, we talk about maybe using the current classification, how it could apply. Um, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of funny or, or like sort of messy classifications get swept under the rug by being class by misclassified on purpose using a unique code. And then in the metadata, we just explain away how this misclassification worked, right? Like, oh, we use this modifier. And if we did that, it's this specific unique classification, this unique uh, ecosystem. Um, and I, I, I think a lot of people, you know, you can't, you have to spend a lot of time reading and if you want to, you want to understand the data in which you're using, you know, you might have to spend a lot of time reading metadata. And so we're trying to make it as, as easy as possible. People don't like to read. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how many of those, because as, as a national classification that, you know, goes from Alaska to, to the Florida, like it's hard to come up with a classification that can handle every single, you know, ecological setting. Um, so how many of those you turn into its own code? How many of those you just leave to sort of, uh, you know, make it a data problem or a metadata problem? Um, those, and those are things that we bring to then the, you know, the group and say, you know, if we add this, you know, how does it, are people going to start using this, this Alaska code and, you know, Death Valley, that, that could be a problem. Like we don't want to do that. So I think there's a lot of, you know, you go through the pros and cons of these things. Um, but that's, I went on a rant there, but to answer your question, like there, you know, people on the ground in Alaska, they see stuff, they read the classification and they're like, this doesn't fit. How do we deal with it? And that comes to me pretty quickly. I mean, I'm three steps removed from data producers. So I, it comes to me quick. I review all the data before it comes in. So because I'm the steward of both the classification and the mapping standard, I sort of have a foot in both worlds. Um, and being part of the mapping process allows me to sort of input into the classification side of things. And as Alaska has a ton of money now, right now, um, for wetland mapping in the state, in a state that's traditionally been data poor, there's a lot going on where, you know, I've been involved with the, there's also, we have a Alaska staff there who's doing a lot of the mapping and she's you know, on the ground and sort of giving feedback to hopefully making sort of some sort of a feedback loop where these, these discoveries in the field can inform the classification. Gotcha. Okay. Long answer. Sorry. Yeah. I, I can't figure out how to raise my hand. I'm sorry, but I just wanted to add in a follow up on what Rusty was just saying there about like, if like in CMAX, we're, we have, um, we're allowed, we allow people to use um, what we call provisional units. So if there's something that you, that you're seeing because you're in some specific location, some exotic locale or, you know, seeing something new for the first time or something like that, or you discover something, or it's just something that we just flat out missed in the classification, you can list it as a provisional unit, but you just kind of have to make sure that you like give thought to where you're placing that in your hierarchy, if you're mapping, and then you are supposed to really spell out that this is a provisional unit and this is why and so on and so forth. And that could be an example of like, okay, if it's just something that that is just missing from CMEX that could then become something that you want to propose to have added in there. But then also, as Rusty said, by and large, and this is what we're finding for the most part as we're going through and looking at people's suggestions, it's like, you know, we really don't want to change the standard that much because you don't want to disrupt the work that's already been done. And then, you know, it, it's a fine line between, <clears throat> you know, being, being able to adapt to things like new technologies and, um, and new information. And then also, you know, being having the benefits of a standard, you know, rather than just having it change all the time, makes it very difficult. So that's kind of how we try to factor in a little bit of 
um, ability for people to to get more specific than than what we allow for. Um, but still trying to maintain that. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions for the panel? I have another one, but I want I don't want to hog. <laughs> Okay. All right. I'll ask my question then. I'm curious how invasive species might make or might change the standards that you all have or disrupt them or, uh, you know, how that, how that might affect these standards. I'll jump in. Um, so in 1979, when Coordin was first written, there were only two subclasses for emergent wetland species, for example. Um, by 2013, Phragmites was a huge problem in the Great Lakes in the Northeast, and we added a subclass for specifically for Phragmites to the standard in 2013. So now Gordon has three subclasses for emergent wetland species, including one specifically for Phragmites. Um, there have been lobbies to include them for reed canary grass and some other invasive species, tamarisk in the, um, in the arid west, and uh, like I say, reed canary grass. Um, and that has happened since 2013. We've kind of figured out with Tamarisk in the arid west, we can come up with our own little sort of code that matches the standard. We don't have to come up with a new one. Uh, reed carry grass, it sort of gets blended in with all the other, you know, cattail and all the other non -persist uh, persistent uh, wetland emergent species. So um, I could see us another subclass coming for uh, something like that. People would want to know where those are. Um, one of the problems, I think, with you know, starting to do stuff like that is species level mapping at a medium resolution data set, you know, one to 12, one to 24,000 is super hard. <laughs> and so I wonder how much, you know, it might be more precise, but less accurate. And I, I think those are the type of discussions that, you know, we have internally of whether or not we want to move forward. I could, I can see, you know, things like invasive species or, or the desire to create more data pushing against these standards and that the standards might have, like Kate was saying, I'd have to adapt a little bit to merging technologies, being able to map more precise, more accurately, um, that's gonna kind of push on some of these standards and the ability of them to be you know, sort of flexible is gonna be important moving forward. I know that FGDC standards are supposed to be reviewed every five to 10 years you know, for this reason. Um, I think that review process, especially at least in our case has been lax because you know, which like they say, you change it, you know, all the, all the work you have to do just to change is gonna, is it worth it? Um, I know budgets aren't really great, especially for us here in the federal government. Uh, we have four people who work here managing, you know, 35 million polygons and 50 million acres a year with four people. Um, so sometimes those things can kind of overwhelm what might be good for the standard or good for data collection in general. Makes sense, thanks. Kate or Alexa, either of you have any? Yeah, I was I was going to say, uh, with invasives, definitely, um, if you have plot, if there's plot data that describes a type that has uh, a dominance of invasive species, new types can be added to the classification. Um, the tricky part is when do you go out of a native? plant community and into a new type, a rural type. So that's just gonna be um, a constant uh, push. And then just uh, historically, um, there, you know, there is like a chestnut forest that's described based on the literature, but that no longer, you know, chest, chestnut uh, trees died across the entire East. It used to be a dominant forest type but that type is still described in the classification. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we, we can in theory uh, add types, but again, when do you tip out of a nat natural type or one, from one type into a more invasive type is gonna be really challenging. Yeah, makes sense. Kate, anything to add? And I think I was actually just kind of typing it in the chat there, but so managing changes to like a vocabulary, like code base itself 
is not difficult. But as Rusty said, it's like we then, you know, if you want to, you know, this is in terms of, you know, not wanting to change too much, right? So we don't want to change too much because then it's not just a matter of like updating your vocabulary and making sure that that, you know, version is available to everybody and you can track, track the changes between them, between the two of those. But it's, you know, then people have to go back. You know, there are people who are relying on habitat maps to make fisheries management decisions and things like that. And you would have to go back and reclassify and generate a new map with, you know, the newly classified information and things like that. And so it would be great if, um, if all that could be done in an automated fashion. And I'm sure it is probably possible, but it's just not there <laughs> right now you know it's hard enough to find like digital or like you know data products that you can interact with sort of in an automated fashion anyway you know from any of the federal agencies so that they're there they're, we have a long way to go before we can get there but i understand that ideal where it should just be you know okay you can make a change here and then you know run some scripts and have it go and go through and run through all your map products and update it that way and you know something like that would be great definitely a goal, but we're very far from there, I think. Right, it took NWI a quarter billion dollars in 40 years to map the lower 48. Um, mm -hmm. So when we changed for, in 2013, um, when we you know, made version two, for example, we took the saturated water regime and split it into three pieces. So now you have, you know, 78% of the, of the data set that had, it uses a water regime that's now been split into three pieces. And so when you're trying to do analysis moving forward, like, what does this piece, what does this now mean? Does it mean the old definition? Does it mean this new one broken into three pieces? Like, what is it? And analysis is sort of gets, it, it's harm. You, you throw broader nets, you know, you, you can only throw, you can only query what you know. So you end up sort of using the old one anyway, because the majority of your data is, is built using the old definitions. I think, you know, being flexible is one thing, but flexibility has a cost and, that might be some of the cost is you know, lack of lack of mm -hmm. precision, lack of knowing what you what you're what. yeah like a standardization the more flexible you are the less standardized <laughs> <Right>. you are <laughs> but it is that if you're too standardized then you can't do anything really um yeah, Stace's question in the chat, she was asking, yeah, Stace, I agree. I think the habitat um, Darwin core term is where I would see using these standards. And I, I do think there is an IRI analog for the habitat term Good. in Darwin core, but I'd have to double check. Hmm. Um, so any other, we're getting near the end of our time. We have five minutes left. Any other questions or things I might have missed in the chat? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, Pierre? Hi, just a, you know, a, a question and also just um, some just a word of advice. You know, one, one of the things we're doing in semantic harmonization is trying to um, harmonize um, a whole set of vocabularies for the cryosphere, for some marine stuff now, uh, for d disasters and hazards, et cetera. And it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. Um, and it would be, of course, much easier if that harmonization happens earlier rather than later, which means like if there are overlapping standards, um, it's really useful if they themselves host an authoritative mapping to another one that they co-developed with that other standard, right? So people don't have to sort of guess at it or, you know, fudge something along. So I'm, I'm just wondering if there is that activity or, you know, maybe ESIP can help this, uh, just giving you the template about how we do that. Of course, you can't do everything in your collection, but it's just useful. We did this with Darwin Core and um, Mix, which is the, the the minimal information for sequence for sequences, any sequence from the GSC, because uh, they're conflicting standards at this stage, right? They're competing, and that shouldn't be. You shouldn't have to choose one or the other, um, and that meant that they had to come up with a um, standardized mapping between them, and they both agree to host that and keep it up to date. So we got the agreement from the Tadwig Executive Board that they would do that. The GSC Board is agreeing to that. There, it looks good, and uh, that's I think that's really important for the future of like mapping and moving data around nimbly. That the people generating these standards and they all operate um, independently for a reason, right? Like you have an application scenario, but allocating some effort and getting funders especially used to the idea of having to fund that mapping activity is really key for this interoperability story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pierre? 
Yeah, it sounds like you guys do work together somewhat. Uh, you know, I heard, you know, CMEX and NBC do, you have tried to overlap in the places where there's hardwoods and then Rusty talked and CMEX and the wetland one also has some overlaps, right? I didn't realize wetland went all the way into deep water. So, um, but yeah, is that a formal process maybe, I guess is the question or just ad hoc? Oh, I'll say, I think it's pretty informal. <laughs> we know, we, you know, the CMEX team have known, you know, we're kind of like overdue to sort of like do our sort of review and, and things like that. And we're like, okay, yeah, part of that, we've got to reach out to you. We actually just like a few weeks ago had like a call with Rusty and others at NWI about, you know, getting together at some point to kind of review where we are with those and, um, and tack up on that. And I think that Mark had sent a, an email out request to Don um, Farber Langador um, about the NBC as well. So just trying to like get it on people's radar and, and we're aware that we need to like kind of match up or meet up and do that. I think with NWR, it's probably not gonna happen until like later this year um, when we have time. But yeah, it's just a matter of finding the time and the availability to do that, so. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, we're all, we're all a little resource limited. Sorry, go ahead, Rusty. I was just gonna say that, um, you know, a lot of the purpose of the FGDC when it was created was to sort of harmonize federal agencies together so that they would work together to, I don't know if co-develop standards is the right word, but at least be aware and um, you know, try to you know, shift into yeah. each other so that it's not so much of an overlap, it's sort of, a, you know, comes together more like this. I know with CMEX when, uh, I remember reviewing CMEX to point out the overlaps when before it was a thing and looking at the potential for a crosswalk between i mean if you think about mm -hmm. NWI quarter classes would be a sort of an umbrella and then cmex would sort of, sort of you know be the pieces underneath that mm -hmm. umbrella um, and then coming up with here's a suite of you know specific uh habitat descriptors that fall underneath this umbrella term that's been coordinated and that would be the crosswalk like here's the thing and this is what it equals um and that you know we kind of had to prove that before you know, we signed off. It's like, hey, there is a way for us to, to you know, <laughs> reverse engineer a coordinate code from CMEX classification. Those things do exist. I mean, yeah. they exist more like in the notebooks of people that were in the meetings and, you know, those types of you notes. Know, like I, I have, I dug up this PDF I made a long time ago uh, for Pew was doing some research with CMEX and, and NWI Crosswalk. And like, I found, I was like, hey, where did this come from? And I was just like, we just had to do this work as part of the generation of these standards, but those, I mean, that wasn't really shared with anybody else outside of the, you know, hey, we're gonna move forward with this. Um, but yeah. FGC is supposed to be the governing body who says, you know, and basically it's, it's because of OMB saying, we will fund the mapping of this once, not twice. Yeah. So really the money drives how much overlap there is. Um, yeah. To prove that you can still get your money and not overlap, then you can do it that way. <laughs> but this is all like you know and pierre just has it in the chat too like to his point it's like okay well if we all had you know some you know uh readily available um you know code base of of, of these standards and everything on that were um accessible to everybody even though if you're not going to allow them to change it i understand your your reservations rusty but it would be so much easier for everybody to sort of like look between um and to be able to do these comparisons as well in an automated way so yeah definitely which is that's where i am <laughs> trying to work on that awesome well i want to thank you it's so much for this panel it was really informative and uh and a great conversation. So uh, appreciate you all taking the time and um, we will meet next in August for this cluster meeting, but, and I'll see some folks hopefully in Pittsburgh for the ESIP summer meeting. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.